delighted to have a close colleague and kind of a fantastic fit for many of the things that we're doing here in Italy is here today, which is Professor Chris Carty from UCLA. Uh, now, I mean, I think everybody really knows pretty well uh, Chris's trajectory, so I'm not going to try and summarize all his achievements, but just to point to the fact that, you know, yes, he's up on many different boxes, let's put it this way, or arm boxes um, <laughs> in science and technology studies really very large. And um, he's basically been the towering figure in science studies around the studies of open source and openness more generally. So that's already fantastic for us because, of course, uh, we have a strong interest in these uh, kinds of things at the moment here. But he's also uh, published a book a couple of years ago after many years of um, doing work, of course, which relates to this in lots of different, um, in lots of different ways on participation. Um, if you haven't read that book, which is called The Participant, I couldn't recommend it more. I mean, this really, I think, is the most interesting by a very long margin book on participation written, certainly coming from some social studies um, from the American perspective. And I think it's also really, yeah, it's wonderful because it comes from a place where, you know, Chris is engaging with a lot of science technology studies work, but it really expands grandly. Um, across it and beyond it, uh, bringing in questions around political participation, civic participation, and uh, basically any type of participation you can think of. So uh, that, that's quite an achievement. And uh, Chris has been doing a lot of work over the last few years on urban forms of life, I say, like a kind of broad, world as possible description. And what he's bringing to us today is a little snippet of this kind of work, which I understand to be working for Chris. So we're very excited uh, to hear this. And we thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Chris. The floor is to you. Thanks very much to be here. Rose, can you have that? Almost. Um, so it's a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, Sabina keeps asking me to do talks, and then it turns out that I'm doing some wacky thing that is not what she expected me to be working on. And <laughs> so I feel a little bit guilty. Um, but this is a um, so so this is part of a project that's been going on for about five years now, which is a big switch from some of the other work that I've done on free and open source software, the internet, the history of computing, then onto this work in participation and whatnot. And it, it was actually really very serendipitous that I ended up doing this work with some colleagues in Los Angeles, uh, in part because I'm in this institute called the Institute of Society and Genetics. And so biological anthropologists and ecologists and whatnot started to discuss things and I got drawn in. Uh, and it became a thing which is now called the Labyrinth Project, which has a whole bunch of different research projects under its um, umbrella. Uh, one of which is on coyotes, um, and no, I just brought our our our, our, uh, um, our lab swag <laughs> to hand out because one of the things my undergraduates and graduate students like to do is sit around and think up new forms of swag. To turn out, these are just stickers. Um, we don't have any track suits. That's my ultimate goal. But <laughs> um, but we did a podcast series together, and that the reason this is relevant is because the thing that I'm going to present to you here is. Um, a collaborative project with two graduate students, Jay Thiesner and Spencer Robbins, that started as a podcast, actually, and has since become an academic paper, which is a kind of inverted way to go about things. Most people who are thinking about doing a podcast series are going to say, oh, well, we did this research, and then we're going to do a podcast to broadcast it or amplify it or whatever. And we really thought through this um, as a podcast first and then turned it into a paper. And one of the reasons that that's uh, the case is because this is really a story about storytelling and about storytelling practices. Um, and so one key to the um, neurotic set of things that I do in my career, moving from hopping from thing to thing, is that I'm uh, way back in time, uh, Donna Haraway's student. Um, and so I learned about storytelling from her and thinking about how science is a form of storytelling. And in that moment in science studies in the 90s, when she described science as a set of storytelling practices, uh, most people took it as a critique of science, as a way of, say, of taking science down an notch and saying it's nothing but storytelling. But I think her intention there was really to say, no, actually, there's lots of different forms of storytelling in the world. There are many ways in which storytelling as, uh, forms a kind of effective force in the world, and science happens to be one of the most effective of those. Um, and so one of the things that we've been thinking about these city coyotes, therefore, is in um, trying to understand how storytelling is an ecologically significant practice in the city, uh, how it has uh, dramatic uh, effects on the ecological relations that take place in the city, um, and not just uh, a representation or um, a representation that uh, can be somehow corrected by scientific or data practices of some sort. Um, so, so what I'm going to give you has a lot of storytelling, 
I'm going to, yeah, you know, it's it's funny because <clears throat> this maybe all sounds under, uncontroversial for people who are in science studies or business, so I'm not maybe saying anything new here. Um, but I think it's really central for me to keep insisting on telling stories and on the practice of interpretation. And it, it was a lot of fun to work with Spencer, who was in English and who was really thinking about this as a hermeneutic problem, um, and um, Chase, who really took up a kind of form of ecological thinking that was uh, in part inspired by reading Edward F. Cohn's book, uh, How Forests Think, and really thinking about biosemiotics as one approach to thinking about ecological relations. So it's a, it's a kind of, I'm just giving you all this background so you can understand where this project is coming from. That may or may not make it more interesting as I read to you, but we'll see, we'll find out, won't we? Uh, so I'll present a bunch of stuff here that is data, uh, but it's actually really just stories and kind of conversations, and I'll explain where those things come from. Uh, and I'm gonna read this um, in part because it's something that we really did write collaboratively, and so I'm channeling the other two. Um, hopefully it'll only take about um, uh, about 30, 35 minutes to read it. Um, okay, but first a little um, primary geography for those who are not uh, familiar with Los Angeles. Um, city of 10 million people. This is Los Angeles County. Um, this is where I live, Santa Monica. This is the ocean. Some islands out here that are not actually that big. <laughs> that's not the scale. Um, pretty much everything you see here that's kind of in the, the lighter color is dense concrete city. Right, so the yellow areas are unincorporated in the center. That doesn't mean they're unpopulated, it just means that they're less dense. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Torrance and Downey and in, in what we're talking about. The city of Los Angeles is a weird, kind of inverted digestive system shaped thing that so goes all the way around here. But the county has 88 different cities in it. And so that means 88 different municipal governments, 88 different ways of governing the ecology in the city. Um, this is not news to some people. For people who've never thought about Los Angeles, it might seem a little strange. Discovered, especially if there are any geographers in the room, that <coughs> geographers with a certain age, there's always someone who's done a project on Los Angeles before. So, um, you know, it, it's very familiar to some people and very unfamiliar to others. Um, it's become a very important place for me to think about doing this kind of work, in part because I'm trying to think about it not just as an example of cities, and so it's not just urban ecology for me, it really is about placing it in Los Angeles, trying to figure out how the storytelling that's happening in the place is really to destroy to, to, uh, to Los Angeles. So, okay, so let's start summoning cloud coyotes here. <laughs> oh yeah, this is, uh, this is my... Um, list of uh, references because as I talk, I won't be reading out the references, but I want you to know that they're there. Uh, <laughs> and the ones that are in bold are some of the ones that have been more important to us uh, in the working out of some of these issues. Uh, and I can return to this slide later if you have questions about the sources. Um, this is how coyotes move on next door. At once keyed to specific places and untethered in a ghostly digital space, coyotes circulate in the homely precincts of, quote, the app where you plug into the neighborhoods that matter to you. Nextdoor is a location-based social media application that allows users in specific neighborhoods defined by the app to communicate directly with one another. Relations of territory, ownership, and domestic belonging are built into the platform. Neighborhoods are demarcated by an algorithm and determine who can speak where, and thus who should feel propriety over what spaces. Nextdoor has become famous for enabling rich white communities to practice constant racial surveillance of their streets, creating an atmosphere of racist paranoia that's led critics to describe neighborhoods, next door neighborhoods as digital gated communities. It allows users to carry the territorial thinking and voluntary surveillance practice into, in, on the app into their relations in physical space, creating an ongoing carceral and surveillance infrastructure. In short, it's a kind of modern social media hellscape in which you get to talk to your neighbors directly online instead of face to face. So. Um, it's probably not something that exists in Europe, but it was, it's quite common in um, Western cities in the US. Um, it's been very popular over the last six years. Imagine Twitter, but only at the local scale, right? Only for the people in, within uh, basically shouting range. <laughs> in Los Angeles, next door is also a tool for residents to police coyotes. They do this not by directly interacting with the animals in question, but by summoning up what we call here cloud coyotes. Los Angeles is coyote territory, and anyone who lives in the city can, if attentive and patient, catch a glimpse of one trotting down the street or furtively darting into the darkness. But thanks to platforms like Nextdoor, it is also now cloud coyote territory, where a vividly animated cloud coyote posted by one user can convince hundreds of commiserating neighbors that they too have seen a real coyote, even if they have not. Nonetheless, cloud coyotes are also real 
and even a casual acquaintance with Nextdoor will demonstrate how often heated debates involving corrupt coyotes erupt on the platform. Cloud coyotes don't stay on next door. They trot from camera phone to neighborhood council to city government to other social media platforms. And actual furry coyotes can die as a result. Groups with names like hashtag evict coyotes and coyotes out of Downey bluntly connect this politics of exclusion and housing insecurity to these matters of non-human co-inhabitants. In response, cities develop coyote management plans that encourage humans to change their ways from managing waste and potential coyote habitat to hazing, which we'll talk about, to creating coyote sighting reporting systems to programs for the outright trapping and killing of local coyote populations. Urban wildlife biologists also enter the fray, cautiously offering information about where urban coyotes are living, what they're eating, and whether their home range sizes might be changing. Research so far is ambiguous about how urban coyotes differ from their rural counterparts and about whether their new behaviors might pose some danger to humans. Cloud coyotes, by contrast, are decidedly mobile, predatory, numerous, and terrifying. They threaten the sanctity of homes and yards. They eat pets with impunity. They even attack children. Cloud coyotes, as fantasy, are a threat to a way of life in Los Angeles. And in that way, they're diagnostic of that way of life the 21st century urban settler colonial ecology. Settler colonialism is a term that we use here, drawing on multiple sources, that specifies an ongoing project of securing control in multiple ways, physical, legal, administrative, over territory now occupied by non-Indigenous residents. It's Angeles is settler colonial territory, obviously. Crucially, this project is also ecological, connecting relations among plants, animals, infrastructures, and habitats together as part of this project. So in this paper, we describe how cloud coyotes help structure settler relations in contemporary Los Angeles by becoming a performative threat and justifying a human response that includes various attempts at extermination, containment, or assimilation. So it's based in fieldwork in Los Angeles, but also in an archive of over 400 conversations we collected from next, next door from the period 2015 to 2019 as part of the Labyrinth Project at UCLA and a collaboration amongst the three scholars that I mentioned before. So what is a cloud coyote? Cloud coyotes and their human non and their human non companions perform in patterned, predictable ways in next door's precisely delimited neighborhoods. Their virtual life often starts when a human encounters a real coyote on a street, in a yard, or sometimes on a surveillance camera. Um, I'm not going to read these to you. I, I actually want you to read them to yourself in your own voice rather than hearing my voice read them because they are direct quotes from next door. So you have to imagine these as your neighbors yelling at you, essentially. <laughs> but I'll try to pause so that you have a second to read them when I put them up. In some grim cases, they encounter only an index of the coyote in the form of a missing or dead cat or dog. But by summoning coyotes in the space of next door, they and their neighbors then amplify the experience, fill in details, extrapolate, debate, and enable their human handlers to perform a set of scripted responses. Representing animals with digital tools can encourage certain kinds of relations like care or commodification. Invoking a cloud coyote activates a set of relations that are structured by the platform and its role in the governmental, ecological, and historical relations of Los Angeles. For Nextdoor, the defining affect is ownership. Nextdoor's neighborhoods are an intimate site for imagining an urban space owned by particular humans and in need of constant, vigilant settlement by them. Cloud coyotes prop up this imaginary precisely by threatening it, but it is a threat that turns out to be impossible to overcome because cloud coyotes, unlike <coughs> real coyotes, are unstoppable. Cloud coyotes don't stay put in next door. Nowhere, in this, nowhere is this clearer than when those who have lost companion animals or who have imagined losing companion animals show up in real spaces of city councils, wildlife hotlines, city streets, animal control centers. People in these spaces often engage in displays of grief and anger over their loss. Sometimes these displays look more like therapy than political activism or participation. I don't want to read this one, but it's going to be good. <laughs> There's a temptation to see cloud coyotes, especially for those with real expertise about real embodied coyotes, 
as vectors for inaccurate or bad faith information about the behaviors of their collecting analogs. So the focus can quickly shift from the cloud coyote to the misinformed human in need of correction. The solution, it would seem, is to provide more accurate information to counter these beliefs and anxieties with the truth of coyote behavior. In fact, people on next door do this to each other all the time. But summoning a cloud coyote on next door is not a way of making claims, true or false, about coyote behavior. Rather, it's a way of activating and reinforcing affects that, in turn, structure inhabitants' relation with the land. Cloud coyotes are not misrepresentations, they're performative or imagistic, like signs in Eduardo Cohn's Rune of Forests. If they represent anything, it's not a coyote, but a particular idea about human coyote relations in the city, which in turn draws on and resonates with human human relations of various sorts. There is evident pleasure when next door users animate the cloud coyote, imagining its unstoppable power to stalk and kill or to hide and to survive. These stories, just to be clear, are part of these things that are part of long con conversations. So people going back and forth in a conversation. And, and there are many different kinds of conversations on next door. Usually there's something like, you know, does anybody know a good plumber? And then there's three things like, here's a good plumber. But when someone mentions a coyote, it can go on for 200 or 400 back and forth posts. It, it re, that's where the pleasure clearly comes in. People just write and write and write. And coyotes are the best thing. Next door facilitates in its very design the settler logic by which cloud coyotes operate. And it, it acted a particular conception of free speech structured around territorial sovereignty by settlers. To act and speak on next door, one must have a door, literally. It's impossible to join the platform without providing proof of a fixed address to uh, fixed address assigned to a neighborhood which is determined by next door. Next door's default settlement is the American single family home with one yard in front and one yard in back. As such, they're doubly designed to police certain kinds of people, human people, renters, tourists, immigrants, temporary residents, migrant workers, unhoused people, criminalized people, and in our case, non-human animals. Crown coyotes are settler coyotes because their behavior is shaped by these design affordances and animated for the desire uh, for, for pro private property, animated by the desire for private property, for exclusion, and the need for an ever-renewing threat that justifies the maintenance of these protected spaces. Over time, the comments involving color cloud coyotes start to organize themselves into some basic categories, coexist, kick out, or kill. Even the apparent exceptions, hosts telling coyote stories or sharing coyote data, imagining LA through coyote eyes, which people occasionally do with obvious, obvious pleasure, then for one of these three options. The question being worked out on next door is what should be done with coyotes by the state or by settler homeowners themselves? Residents debate because they want to know how not to govern, not only to govern the coyotes, but themselves and their pets and other people. <laughs> coyote debates refuse to be about only coyotes. The language of coyote eradication moves in striking parallel with anti-homeless, anti-migrant, and anti-black rhetorics in Los Angeles. Anti-coyote activists often explicitly invoke images of both legal and racial exclusion, including evictions specifically in names like hashtag evicted coyotes or coyotes out of Downey, which is modeled on a previous group that called itself gangs out of Downey. Are coyotes moving into the city? Do they belong here? Can we kick them out to where they do belong? These are questions that are easily asked uh, on next door about coyotes, black people, unhoused people, making it part of a broader project of defining and defending an exclusionary conception of the human. This might seem to be primarily a problem of state power. Indeed, in the US context, coyotes are the jurisdiction of the National Park Service, the United States Department of Agriculture, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, or local animal services departments in those 88 cities that I mentioned. Uh, and we have another paper about arbitrariness in the governance of animals, which is uh, dealing with the fact that there are 88 different ways to govern coyotes in one county. So, uh, but while these agencies are important, in the case of cloud coyotes, residents play a much more central role, one best understood through the frame of settler colonialism. Settler colonialism describes a historically specific ongoing project of removing indigenous people from the land and replacing them with settlers endowed with new legal and juridical forms of exclusionary ownership. 
But the important is that under settler colonialism, the choices and decisions about how to govern a place are delegated to individual settlers, backed by but not directly executed by the settler state. So this delegation is what's really important in differentiating it from other forms of colonialism. It's delegated to private individuals. The forms of delegated power are, of course, violent, bureaucratic, economic, but in this case, it's important that they're also ecological. To settle is to transform a landscape in vital ways that sustain settlers and displace relations, relations or arrangements that are already in place. Settling includes bringing in forms of property, enclosure, fencing, as much as it does ways of cultivating land, raising livestock, planting things that settlers like to eat, and all the forms of management necessary to maintain these new ecological relations. So the Potawatomi philosopher Kyle White describes the settler colonial project as a vicious sedimentation of one ecology over another. By seeking to establish their own homeland, settler populations are working to create their own ecologies out of the ecologies of ind indigenous peoples, which often requires that settlers bring in, in, in additional materials and living beings, plants, animals from abroad. <clears throat> Los Angeles is a complicated version of this story, which we don't, I don't have time to go into really, but it's got multiple layers of this, of course, because you have uh, indigenous residents, you have Spanish colonization, you have multiple versions of Anglo colonization, both external and internal um, to, the, to the country each of which involves the replacement of previous ecological relations. Um, the, the, the most recent of that is probably ecological restoration of things like wetlands and uh, ecological areas, right? But then prior to that, there's oil, oil drilling, and prior to that, there's orange groves, prior to that, there's ranching, and on down. So it's a complicated version of that, but as I say, it's not quite enough room to go into all the detail here. Coyotes are part of that ecology, and their status, behavior, even their evolution in their, their forest, both background and legacy of this ongoing settler colonial project. The consequences are not only ecological, alongside the deaths of real coyotes, White continues, vicious sedimentation damages settlers' inclinations for consensual decision-making with indigenous people, which makes recognizing colonization and imagining decolonization of these relations extremely difficult. While urban ecologists and biologists talk of coyote habitat, often discussing the ways coyotes adapt and move between natural and rural environments or along an urban wildlife gradient or built into built environments. Such naturalizing language misunderstands the way that ecological remaking is part and parcel of the historical and biological transformations that have been wrought by settler colonialism. More than just a natural or unnatural habitat, urban or rural, Coyotes inhabit a landscape held in place by ongoing practices of settlement, which not only displace the coyote, but also specific kinds of people for specific political purposes. And I might also point out here that it's different, for instance, than what Alfred Crosby defined as ecological imperialism, right? So where he described these sort of biological portmanteaus of uh, plants and animals that are moved between places, right? Because it's kind of within one place, replacement of these ecologies, so more like a succession than a movement. Cloud coyotes are new entrants into this project. They're part of the structure through which settler forms of governance are enacted by residents with the help of social media platforms. The genius of settler colonialism is that ecological governance does not require centralized state action if residents themselves are allowed to enact their desire for a safe domestic space, clear property boundaries, and a sense of ownership. Real urban coyotes, fleshy urban coyotes, unsettle this project by occasionally refusing to comply with settlers' attempts to transform the ecology. But it's cloud coyotes who pose the real threat. They're the coyotes who overflow, persist, and will not stay put and which in turn creates the desire to strengthen and police the boundaries and relations in question. The cloud coyote thrives because there's a ready-made fantasy of viability and threat that underwrites the ongoing practices of settler colonialism. Crucial to the project of settlement is that settler subjects desire to remake land for their own use. The inexhaustible threat of the cloud coyote drives this desire out of the virtual biome and into the yards, neighborhoods, council areas, and landscapes in the city. They renew a desire for a kind of domestication that enlists settlers as agents of the state in intimately remaking ecology. A real coyote might come and go in this space, creating a periodic upheaval. Cloud coyotes, however, never go away. For much of the 20th century in the US, settlers with the help of US government waged war against North American predators like wolves, bears, mountain lions, and coyotes. States paid bounties to private citizens who could prove their kills. One of the US government's prominent predator hunters reported the possibility of killing up to 350 coyotes in less than 10 days between hunting and poison. 
Exceedingly efficient killing of large carnivores and other pesky vermin animals is one of the most striking signatures of settler colonialism in 20th century United States history. Though wolves were essentially eliminated from the lower 48 states by mid-century, the coyote escaped this extirpation. In fact, thanks to their remarkable behavioral and biological adaptability, coyotes have spent the last century expanding their range. Once occupying only the plains and deserts of the North American West and Southwest, coyotes can now be found across the continent and as far south as Costa Rica, including in cities as densely urbanized as Los Angeles and Chicago, and literally anywhere in the city. We, we can find them in places you most you would think would be most unlikely, densely concrete areas of downtown Los, Los Angeles. Basically. Despite or because of their flourishing, coyotes continue to be targeted by campaigns of organized killing and with several key differences. In place of the US federal government, it's now private homeowners and municipal governments that work to bring about a world without predators. And whereas in previous decades, protecting ranchers' livestock provided the main impetus for killing coyotes, today it's settlers' beloved cats and dogs who represent the front line of settler populism. This transition from livestock to pets is not simply a material replacement of one valuable creature for another. It comes with new kinds of fantasies, desires, and anxieties as well. Whereas earlier settlers may have mourned the violence attacked on a valuable animal and demanded the extermination of a predator, pets activate somewhat different values and anxieties. These are visible in a weirdly common word image that repeats on next door. And I'll just point out that these are three versions of that, not one quote. Such images mark the passage of the cloud coyote, the pet's dismembered body, oftentimes a cat, laid out on a front lawn as if on display. The horrific simplicity of this picture, the flat homogenous background of the grass, simultaneously a surface and a screen onto which to project the fantasy, and a pet once recognizable as whole now in parts, gives this image its wide-ranging currency and emotional impact. As if a nightmare, but carrying the supposed facticity of a picture, although it's never actually an actual picture that would be going too far. It's all for only ever a word picture that's shared here. The image forces through the imaginary of the next door community, eliciting nervousness and sympathy in equal measure. There's no doubt that the main emotional and effective vector of settler politics around coyotes is the family pet, the companion animal. Labels like fur babies and fur kids. Uh, are commonly used on next door, inducted into the space of the family. They collapse the distinction between human and pet, standing in as the perfect victim for imagined attacks and thus demanding the extermination or abandonment of the coyote. The threat of the cloud coyote poses to the fur baby is a complex intertwining fear, anxiety, and grief that cultivates a dangerous orientation towards pets by imagining them as children. But the confusion of pet and child puts both in actual physical danger and constant imagined danger too. Uh, a kind of selective animal kinship locks family and ownership in, in a kind of discursive relation. Family as threatened, the predator as threat, and assertions of ownership as the desire to protect some animals and exclude others. So if a rancher's loss of livestock to a coyote can be valued in terms of the loss of income, food on the table, the loss of a domestic pet implicates a different set of values, not only the loss of a loved one, but also the free and fair use of one's own backyard. Post after post mentions backyards and the painful idea of being unable to extract value from it in just the way that individuals desire, including individual cats and dogs, who are increasingly recruited into the settler relations as owners by a kind of pet primogenitor. Again, these are three different versions of the thing, uh, thing from the, uh, the conversations. However, following the structure of impossible desire, the fence is both necessary and inadequate at the same time vis-a-vis -vis cloud coyotes. You have to have a fence, but it's impossible to keep the coyotes out. You see this again over and over. I, I just have one here, we have like four more just like this. Coyote rollers, which are a device designed to prevent coyotes from getting over fences. They have a roller on the edge, so when they jump up on the fence, they roll back down, right? are frequently discussed, as are motion sensor lights, sprinklers, alarms, and other kinds of uh, more and less folk remedies for, for coyotes. Wolf urine is my favorite. You really need a good container because you don't want to get wolf urine on you. Bad news. <laughs> um, the fortress mentality of hated LA uh, 
which is well known, I think, is a fantasy of a city without coyotes. Uh, but it also emphasizes the seemingly unstoppable capacity of the coyote to penetrate the fortress yard and to renew the necessity of fortifying the legal and material structures and settlement. So a similar structure is visible with the leash, which is both a tool of power and control, but also this sudden space of vulnerability that people talk about all the time. Coyotes getting keyed in right off the leash. Right? Um, so that's, a, that's another structure that we see regularly. The cloud coyote, therefore, is ungovernable, which is a kind of paradoxical status. Um, as Hassan Hajj writes, who's someone we relied on a little bit for this, um, it's paradox ungovernability means it's paradoxical in that it indicates, on the one hand, an inability of governmental forces to relate to it, and yet also implies a historically acquired familiarity. It denotes a relation paradoxically marked by a certain intimate lack of relationality or relating to something through a recognition of the permanent inability to relate to it. Real urban coyotes have very few relations with humans. And even fewer humans cultivate sustained relations with urban coyotes. Some people do. We know a couple that lives in one of the canyons who fed coyotes and them basically living inside the door. But it's very rare for people to actually cultivate any sustained relationships with a real coyote in the city. You just see them and they disappear again, or they appear to you, depending on how you But anybody who uses next door, however, will have relations with cloud coyotes. And the attention grabbing behavior of these coyotes is pretty much guaranteed to be a nuisance even as the behavior of real neighborhood coyotes remains mostly a mystery. The ungovernable cloud coyote who leaps six foot fences and snatches dogs from leashes is capable of a constant incursion into a would-be homely space. Cloud coyotes then are saturated with the paradox that Hodge locates in the ungovernable of, of relating to something through the recognition of the permanent inability to relate to it. The cloud coyote is a vicious, unstoppable predator with no remorse and an insatiable appetite, kind of serial killer that targets fur babies possibly even human children, dismember them and raise their body parts on the lawn as evidence of its evil. The yard and the leash extend modes of settler space making up to the point where they are threatened and must be asserted again and again. Pet owners therefore insist repeatedly on the right for their fur babies to poop unattended in their yards or have free reign from the leash. They insist on the infinite but incomplete extensibility of these human pet property relations. In the settler imagination, city space must be made safe for such relations. So in a polarized media landscape that we have today, charged images like a dead cat on the lawn are powerful tools for organizing. So there's pro-coyote groups like Coyote Clan and Protect Our Coyotes and anti-coyote groups like Coyote Hunting and Evict Coyotes. Whereas next door coyote posts are about disagreement and to some extent about information sharing, Facebook groups bring like-minded people together for a purpose. A series of suspiciously similar Facebook groups have popped up over the last several years. Uh, and they all say something like, this group is for people wanting to bring down the coyote population. The only side we discuss is how to get our government to do their job and start evicting coyotes. This group is meant for like-minded people wanting to find solutions to the coyote issue. We do not support <laughs> coyote protests. There are several more of these. This one's from Coyotes. Torrance, there's another one from a couple of other cities that I can tell you. And although you might be, this might be taken for evidence of a grassroots conservative movement, these groups can in reality be traced entirely to a single person. Torrance City Councilman Aurelio Matucci. In 2016, Matucci sensed the pain in people's hearts and made a Facebook page called A Coyote Killed My Pet in Torrance, <laughs> despite having never seen a coyote himself. Afterwards, Matucci says he saw coyotes everywhere. Matucci used momentum to run for Torrance City Council on a strong anti-coyote platform. He has admitted in interviews that the likelihood of a coyote attacking a human was slim to none, and that there are small adjustments people can make to keep their pets safe. But this is not his public message. <laughs> These are both from his uh, Facebook page. He's fighting, in his words, for a cleaner and safer torrents. As a politician, and he's very much in the mold of Trump, his platform is pure American conservatives. He calls Black Lives Matter a terrorist organization. He calls homelessness cancer and says it's spreading. Cleaning up torrents is a cipher for strong police, etc. Matucci invokes the cloud coyotes as a threat to ownership and control over the city, which plays on settler desires. So although settlers are deputized, delegated the right to remake the ecology and to assert ownership over it, this work comes with fear and anxiety. Matucci recognizes this and offers as an agent of the state to step in as a kind of delegated apex predator. 
the person will finally backstop the role of the settlers. Makes sense. This is also equal to G. <clears throat> Should be labeled. Mutucci does use this kind of the way to offer himself and the state as a kind of backstop to their settlement, implicit and unstated as it must be. The cloud coyote is absolutely central to this offer because it must appear impossible to even consider some form of coexistence with coyotes in the city. The apparent impossibility of living with coyotes, the ridiculous proposition, provides an opportunity for the state to demonstrate its capacity and its necessity. The result in torrents is an ongoing program of trapping and killing coyotes year round, even while closely neighboring cities object to the violence and to the ecological consequences of doing so. A few miles to the east in the city of Downey, an alternative approach is on offer. Coyotes out of Downey educates residents about what to do to avoid getting into conflicts with coyotes in the first place. Secure trash at night, encourage residents to keep their pets on a leash, keep cats inside, Coyotes Out of Downey turns municipal attention towards coyotes, not in the form of violent interventions, but by funneling residents' anxieties into a version of community police. The ambition of such approaches is to reorganize urban ecologies beginning with human-coyote relations so that coyotes' use of space no longer overlaps with that of human property. And this requires not just behavioral interventions on coyotes, but careful management of human behavior too, because the two are intertwined. Coyotes out of Downey is, roughly speaking, on the side of coyote, coyote uh, coexistence, despite the name. If people could discipline themselves, coyotes would no longer be a problem. It's so coyote management in a kind of biopolitical mode. Through self-discipline and self-governance, humans can turn discipline, can in turn discipline and govern coyotes. Coyotes are, out of Downey is actually part of a larger shift that's been happening in the city. The city of Los Angeles to stop killing coyotes in 2004. And coyote expert Eric Strauss from Royal Marymount, who consults with many of the cities, puts it bluntly lethal management of wildlife as a birth recourse is part of an outdated paradigm. Instead, municipalities across LA County have started creating coyote management plans, or more often simply cutting and pasting these plans from one city government website to another. We have a list of about 60 of the 88, with most of which are identical from one city to the next which is in itself an important point about how governance happens in Los Angeles, based governance, I suppose. In place of killing, these plans offer a range of practices, cleaning of trash, reshaping urban habitat to, less coyote friend, to be less coyote friendly, and above all, hazing as a central though unproven practice. Hazing is the idea that residents should actively threaten or scare coyotes away using a variety of techniques like yelling, waving, or throwing things in ways that do not harm coyotes, but somehow convince them not to return. None of these non-lethal plans and techniques, however, address the central question of where coyotes should be. Once, hey, where exactly should the newly distant and afraid coyotes go? To a different city entirely? To different neighborhoods? Or should they remain nearby, but out of sight? Coyote management plans don't say. Such approaches still work according to the same settler logics of containment and assimilation. Here, containment means keeping coyotes out, create reserves, build fences and walls, innovate coyote rollers, or wolf urine spray bottles, for instance, create uh, roving, space zoning, human animal pairs that haze coyotes or encourage coyotes to hunt elsewhere by securing food or cleaning up clutter. Assimilation, by contrast, might mean knowing coyotes better, more science of urban coyotes, uh, studying and learning about their movements and behaviors, collaring and tracking them in order to learn more, creating coyote sighting apps to know more about when and where they pose a threat, and hazing them in the end. Assimilation, like surveillance, works on the logic of strategic intervention. Rather than indiscriminate killing, the killing would only be absolute and necessary when one can more precisely predict the risk. So it's a kind of risk management paradigm of coyotes that you know, should, should, should be completely familiar from other practices of risk management in society. Community, uh, coyote management plans perform and reinforce this structuring principle of private property as the basis for urban land relations. Moreover, some cities have adopted or, or revised coyote management plans in response to political pressure cultivated on social media platforms like Nextdoor. And this process illustrates how cloud coyotes animate affective circuits that knit state power, individual settlers, and digital storytelling into a governing structure. The process has significant ecological effects. Many coyote management plans contain landscaping rec recommendations, for instance, that aim to maximize enclosure and visibility by encouraging re re residents to remove brush and build fences over six feet high 
with little to no consideration for either native vegetation or other ecological consequences. So by prioritizing settler safety, comfort, and peace of mind over consideration of their impact on other lifeways, these documents reify domestication as a primary mode of dwelling and intimately connect state power and private sphere in the settler's homestead. Los Angeles has the largest Native American population in the nation, even though uh, the local tribal organizations representing the original inhabitants are small. So the Tongva, the Chumash, and the Hachman are relatively small in number. But the city itself boasts the largest Native American population across the country uh, of any American city. There's no legal or practical reason why urban wildlife managers could not adopt policies that recognize the rights of Native people in Los Angeles um, to make decisions about who belongs on this land and how our relationships with coyotes might, might work out. There may be opportunities for state agencies and tribal groups to conduct or otherwise collaborate in urban areas. At the, same, at the same time, it's important to note that collaboration is not the only horizon for anti-colonial practice. Sometimes requests for tribal consultation can function as unwelcome demands on indigenous groups, limited time and resources, which are themselves consequences of colonial violence. We've encountered this ourselves. We encounter it over and over again. Demand to consult with Native American peoples in the city is its, itself a form of violence because it just adds to the list of things for Native groups to do. So uh, it's not the only solution. Inclusion is not the only solution. Moreover, some Native people may refuse collaboration as part of a broader refusal to recognize the legitimacy of the settler state, or may simply cultivate relations with places and beings outside of structures of state recognition. What forms of anti-colonial management urban wildlife might take, and whether it might include, for example, tribal organizations rewriting, rejecting, or ignoring community management plans is neither up to the settler state nor to us, the authors here in this case. But diagnosing the cloud coyote, however, can be a warning not just to wildlife managers, but to all those who design, create, and use digital tools like Nextdoor. There's an unacknowledged relationship between land and cloud here. Cloud coyotes as lively online images of lively animals more than coyote relations aren't likely to go away. Flesh and blood coyotes will continue to move through cities and people who encounter them will continue to tell stories about them. The problem is not that people turn to social media to perform these imagined encounters, nor that the digital creatures living there sometimes convey inaccurate information about real coyotes. Actual coyote behavior is only ever a part of the image of relations that the cloud coyote animates. The issue with the proliferation of cloud coyotes is that applications like Nextdoor, in their very design, support and shape <laughs> users' ecological imaginaries according to logics of enclosure, ownership, property, and domestication, even when they innocently think that they're merely warning neighbors to be safe. By examining how online conversations impact the governance of actual coyotes, our analysis of Nextdoor reveals that the it reveals the unavoidable implication of abstract digital space in material land relations. Indeed, even beyond the fact of internet technologies needing land and energy infrastructures in order to function, the existence of cloud coyote points to the insistently territorial function of the seemingly deterritorialized digital commons of the cloud. By defining access to digital neighborhoods according to property relations, Nextdoor models the assumption of settler access to land and the dynamics of possession and dispossession that continue to undergird the processes of settlement and its ongoing sedimentation in places like Los Angeles. And given the histories of segregation and chronic housing injustice that shape ownership and residence in these cities, an application like Nextdoor ensures that Native voices are largely excluded from these political and ecological narrative processes. There are, of course, other kinds of newly emergent digital technologies that are designed to invite further interest in land and ecology. Applications like iNaturalist, for instance, who good for cataloging and describing local populations of flora and fauna, but their uses are also circumscribed by rather narrow scientific frameworks and data-driven affordances. Applications for doing community services are also rarely designed for sociality and so far do not invite or even acknowledge the possibility of anti-colonial storytelling practices. Other land-bound digital storytelling tools, perhaps nurtured by urban wildlife experts of other kinds or indigenous Americans or others, might give rise to new coyote story and practices and so perhaps other kinds of cloud coyotes like coyotes themselves, whose phenotypic variation across biomes is wide ranging, the cloud coyotes we found out next door are just one local expression of a widely dispersed and potentially unruly genetic form. Here and now, they animate, they animate procedures 
of settlements. The cloud coyotes are reminders that all of our practices, digital, political, and narrative, place us in unavoidable relations with other people and with land. The spaces where city dwellers imagine their relations with coyotes could be tools for anti-colonial practice if they work to undo the domesticating and property logics that now define the cloud coyote. And that is the end. Thank you.